I've never been able to say in my life that I've gone viral. I think the only time I went viral was when I had a bronchial infection last year. But our next guest has indeed gone viral on the internet, on Twitter, with a long-form Twitter rant that was not only epic in style, but uh, very interesting and illuminating and made us intrigued, made us want to get to know him better. So he joins us now. Greg, Greg Doucette is a lawyer in North Carolina. Uh, he is a Republican. I believe he may be a politician or about to become one. And um, he had a Twitter rant recently about a client. So we wanted to talk to him about that. So Greg, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So let's start with this a little bit. Um, you start out, you, you're, you tell the story of a client of yours who was, well, well, just tell us the story. Why don't we just start there? Well, I had a young man come to my office. I, uh, I do a lot of work with students, so high school and college kids. It ends up being a lot of criminal defense work, a lot of traffic tickets, weed violations, that sort of thing. Um, I had a young man come in, and he had been charged with reckless driving to endanger, which in North Carolina is a, a class two felony. Worst case scenario, you could theoretically get up to 60 days in jail. And in his case, he was still a teenager, so he still only had a learner's permit. Um, so his mother was very concerned about it. She's the one that sought me out and met with the two of them in my office, kind of wanted some explanation as to what was going on. He had told me that he was driving around his neighborhood, a, uh, an animal of some kind came into the roadway, he had slammed on the brakes and turned, and in the process, the car spun out. The uh, officer that came by to give him a citation said that someone called in that he was doing donuts in the roadway and that the officer investigated and there were skid marks in the street that showed a 360 degree uh, spin. So he gave him the ticket for reckless driving. The young man's mom, for whatever reason, uh, thankfully did not trust the officer, didn't want to believe what he was saying, went to the location where this had supposedly happened and took a bunch of pictures and thankfully, she still had those on her phone and gave them to me. And the uh, the skid marks that are on the street in those pictures don't match the 360-degree uh, explanation that the officer had put into his report that was filed with the court system. So you put your your uh, uh, your client's pictures or, or the mother's pictures on the phone, and where the police where the police officer had written, you know, 360 degrees skid marks and so on. There's basically I see nothing. Um, so, uh, and let's just interject here for a second to say, you wrote on Twitter, I get off, asked off, and if I hate police, I don't. I look at police generally like I look at teachers generally. And I think you made a great point here. You said when a teacher decides to rape a student, we don't demonize all teachers. Same with teachers who are inept at teaching. So uh, your client, by the way, was uh, uh, African-American. Uh, it shouldn't matter, but uh, I'm guessing it probably does. What do you think? What's your guess? Well, at least in North Carolina, it does for sure. You know, we have, to the state's credit, for about 12 years now, we've been collecting a lot of data on uh, traffic stops and consent searches versus warrant searches and a lot of the activities that the police do. And we made all that data available to the public and to researchers. And there's actually a website called OpenDataPolicingNC.com that just came out a couple months ago where it takes all of this data over the past decade and spreads it out by county. So you can actually see by police department um, the number of people that have been stopped, their criteria, men, women, race, everything else. And what you find is, for whatever reason, um, people of color are targeted well in excess of their percentage of the population. And it's interesting that that happens with traffic stops because for a traffic case, typically you're not going to see the race of the driver when you pull them over. So theoretically, the initial stop is race neutral. Where you see the racial component of it is people of color are more likely to have their vehicles searched, even though the actual likelihood of finding contraband is no different between the different uh, racial groups. And I guess I would, I would also say, Greg uh, Doucette, that... Um, yeah, I would imagine that a lot of folks, uh, particular, and I'm just guessing here, and I, I'll say that up front, but I would guess that certain folks, more perhaps more prosperous, perhaps white folks, are going to be more likely to just be let go with a warning, and then it wouldn't get recorded in the system at all, would it? Yes, sir. And that's part of, again, it's one of those things that's kind of been weird in North Carolina. Once we started tracking everything, We've now had situations where occasionally some officers who are under, you know, monitoring, for lack of a better word, for targeting people of color, 
uh, have now gotten to a point where they won't even notify dispatch that they're about to pull someone over because they don't want it to get recorded on their statistics. Um, just here in Durham, about probably three or four months ago, we had a situation like that happen where an officer had pulled someone over. There was a struggle of some sort, and the officer had been shot. And the narrative in the media was that the driver had been a felon and was trying to shoot the officer. The evidence came out that actually the officer had shot himself in the midst of trying to reach into the vehicle when he shouldn't have. Um, so when that criminal case went forward, the, uh, the young man was found not guilty of that particular charge. But one of the key issues with that case was that the officer was being monitored because he had had a record for targeting minorities. So he never notified dispatch that he had actually pulled someone over. He had no backup or anything else because he didn't want that to show up on his statistics. And now, so here you've got a situation where uh, you get you get this kind of selectivity in the way the statistics are being tracked, and then the statistics include all these cases you talk about them that if this this young man hadn't been fortunate enough to have uh, a mother on the scene who took a picture and a mother who was both uh, how to put it had enough foresight and uh, money, frankly, to hire an attorney then uh, he, he would have been just another statistic where as far as the, I mean, it's great that the database exists, but otherwise the database must might just have shown that this was a kid who was guilty when in fact he was innocent, right? Yes, sir. It is very rare, outside of like a, a DWI or something with very severe consequences, a traffic case almost never goes to trial. So typically the only evidence that the district attorney is going to have is going to be what is included in the officer's narrative of what's happening. Um, and that's enough to get a conviction. So if it's something where you decided to go to trial on it, let's say, you know, you've been charged with running a stop sign or something, they'll call the officer. The officer is going to read what he wrote in his narrative and say that because of his training and experience, this is what occurred. You'll put your driver on the stand. He's going to say, I didn't do it. And the judge, nine and a half times out of ten, is going to side with the officer because they're paid and trained by us to be truthful public servants and only giving the facts of what happened. That's the idea. And and now getting back to your point about, you know, looking at police the way you look at teachers, you know, that most of them are good, that if, if one of them uh, doesn't do their job well or seems to be incompetent or is dishonest or abuses a trust, that that doesn't reflect on uh, police altogether. And that seems to me to be a very reasonable, balanced approach. And it seems to me in this case mm -hmm. that the police officer, uh, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, my interpretation of these facts as you laid them out is that this police officer is probably not acting with the utmost of integrity in this situation. Well, as an attorney, I try not to think of anyone in a group because Lord knows I would be uh, slammed just as much as all the other lawyers out there. Um, but on this particular officer, you know, I agree with you. I think there are really only three explanations unless there's something that has happened that I just don't know about. Either one, he was lazy and didn't investigate. Two, he was incompetent. He did investigate but just doesn't know what 360 degrees means. Or three, you know, he was lying about what he put in his narrative. I mean, I can't think of some other explanation that's not one of those three. And any of those three, to me, means he shouldn't be testifying in any courtroom, at least in my area. Now, does this get to be a matter of public record so that if someone else comes up and is uh, arrested based on this officer's testimony, they can access this and challenge his credibility? Well, the actual, so it, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. So in North Carolina, we are weird in the sense that we do not have what is called open file discovery for district and traffic cases. You know, in most states, whatever the prosecution has, the defense gets automatically. In North Carolina, we only have that if it's a felony, something in superior court. So anyone who wants to figure out the case, you know, my client's name, who the arresting officer was and all that, can. That information is public record. But the fact that the narrative was inaccurate. That narrative is only accessible by the district attorney's office and by the police, so members of the public won't get that. Um, what we've done is I've talked with the family about filing a complaint with the police department, so there's at least an internal paper trail. And of course, you know, everyone who's on Twitter now at least has some idea of what's going on, and I've, I'm not shy about uh, sharing the details. Um, but beyond that, really all they're going to have access to is the same information that we get normally, um, at least until someone in the General Assembly changes the law to require open file discovery for everything. 
Now, you you make the eminently reasonable point that to challenge an individual police officer does not mean that you're challenging all police officers or police officers as as a class or a group or whatever. And and yet you get you run into this kind of uh, psychology that says, well, you must be anti-police, but you're not anti-police. I would imagine if you're a Republican, which I understand you are, I imagine that you probably are a law and order sort of guy. I am. And it's not only that, but growing up, I've got police in my family. You know, I have an uncle who was a police officer. Uh, one of our closest family friends growing up was a police officer. I once got lost in the mall and he was the guy that actually found me back when I was around five years old. Um, you know, growing up, elementary and middle school, we take field trips to the police station. And even in my job, I rely on officers being straight with me about the cases. You know, if I've got a guy who's been charged with something and there's evidence that he's guilty, I'm not going to waste everyone's time trying to take him to trial and, you know, find a loophole to get him off. We're going to come up with some kind of reasonable punishment that, you know, fits the facts of the the situation without ruining my client's life. So I deal with officers on a daily basis and the ones that work well with me, I work well with them and it helps keep the system running smoothly. It just, you know, just like any other profession, you have those couple bad eggs that once you figure out who they are, they're really bad news and can screw things up for everybody. You know, I, I, I got to say, uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, and, but in reading your blog and all that, I get the sense, Greg, that you're uh, a very sensible guy and uh, also that you're very frustrated with what the Republicans are doing there in your state of North Carolina. So I got to ask you, I can understand being an ind- independent, but then why are you a Republican? Uh, I tell people it's because I'm a masochist and I like punishing myself. Um, it's something where I'm, I'm a small L libertarian, as I tell folks. You know, way back in 2000, I briefly registered as a capital L libertarian, uh, went to a party meeting and realized they were crazy. The very first debate that they were talking about was whether or not streetlights were uh, an example of government overreach. So I stopped doing the libertarian thing. Uh, and have been a Republican since. I mean, it's something where, as a small business owner, as a guy who enjoys his firearms, you know, there are certain things that mean a lot to me that I'm closer to a Republican than I am to a typical Democrat, at least in North Carolina. Um, but on a lot of other issues, you know, uh, for example, a lot of, of racial stuff, you know, I grew up in an integrated neighborhood. I've got folks that are multiple races that are among my friends. You know, I went to a historically black law school. I'm very different from the stereotypical Republican, at least in this state. You know, in Durham, it's not quite as, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Not quite as homogeneous. In Durham, we have a lot of different folks from different backgrounds who have similar political beliefs. Um, But just kind of my upbringing puts me out of step with both parties. So then the question is, out of the two, which one am I closer to? And on a lot of the economic issues, I find myself closer aligned to the GOP. Well, I would say uh, let's get you in the North Carolina State Senate and then try to make a convert of you. Um, (laughs) But uh, anyway, listen, Greg, Greg Doucette, so you're running for the state Senate, right? I am. Yes, sir. District 22 in North Carolina. Well, good luck with that. Uh, Good luck with your work uh, defending folks out there. And thanks for coming on the program. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.